There are many people around the world who are in a state of real difficulty at the moment. Many people who we know who are very unwell, especially those people in Syria at the moment and Saudi Arabia and in Bahrain, where the revolution is taking place, where there is murder and atrocity. Let us remember them, inshallah, sincerely and hope for their safety, security and victory for the truth of the goodness of the coming of the awaited Savior. بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم أما يجيب المضطر إذا دعا ويكشف السوء 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 يا الله يا الله يا الله يا الله يا الله بفضلك وبرحمتك يا أرحم الراحمين سلوات الله أعوذ بالله من الشيطان الرجيم بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم الحمد لله رب العالمين الحمد لله الذي هدانا لهذا وما كنا لنهتدي لولا أن هدانا الله والصلاة والسلام على أشرف الأنبياء والمرسلين خاتم النبيين سيد الممجد بشير المصدق المصطفى الأمجد محمود الأحمد أبي القاسم محمد وعلى أهل بيته الطيبين الطاهرين المعسومين ولعن الله ولا الظالمين من الأولين والآخرين أما بعد قال إمام الحج عليه السلام والحمد لله على الحمد لله على حلمه بعد علمه والحمد لله على عفوه بعد قدرته والحمد لله على طول أناته في غضبه وهو قادر على ما يريد الحمد لله خالق الخلق باسط الرزق فالك الإصباح ذي الجلال والإكرام والفضل والإنعام الذي بعد فلا يرى وقرب فشهد النجوى تبارك وتعالى سلوات Awaited Savior, Imam Zamana, my respect to teachers, elders, brothers and sisters, Salaamu Alaikum Jami'an wa Rahmatullahi wa Barakatuh. The next section of Da'a Iftitah, which has been given to us by the awaited Savior of humanity and our Imam, Imam al Hajj Ajjalallahu Ta'ala Faraj al Sharif. Is arguably this section the most important section of the entire Da'a. When we say this section, you may recall on the second night in our introduction to Da'a Iftitah, we mentioned that the Da'a is split into two. The entire Da'a is a praise, but it's split into two in that the first half is a praise towards Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And the second is a praise towards the divine leaders being Ahlul Bayt, salawatullahu salamu alayhim ajma'een. As for the first section, it is arguably that this particular line or this particular number of lines that we will discuss tonight are the most important lines in regards to the first section. Because if you correctly understand this section of the dua, if you and I walk away tonight inshallah having been able to grasp what the Imam is trying to tell us, then our entire lives will be ones in which we have gained 
a certain direction which will lead us throughout the rest of our lives. Hence we say it is arguably the most important section within the first half of the du'a. What does the Imam والسلام, say? Alhamdulillah ala hilmihi ba'da ilmi. In this part of the du'a he is stating praise belongs to Allah. Why? Because he has forbearance. Hilm after ilm, after knowledge. And then at the end of this section, he starts by saying, Alhamdulillah alladhi khaliq al-khalq, basit al-rizq, falik al-isbah, dil jalali wal ikram. All praise belongs to Allah. Why? Because He is the creator of all the created things within this universe. It is these two particular lines that I want to assess tonight, insha'Allah, and have a look at why these two lines could be the most significant lines within this section of the Holy Du'a. All praise belongs to Allah for His forbearance after knowledge. And all praise belongs to Allah. Why? Because He is the one who has created everything within creation. When it comes to hilm after ilm, the Imam is signifying that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has full knowledge of everything. He is aware of my past, he is aware of my future. When I look into my own past and I see how many inordinate actions, how many sins, how many times I have fallen, but specifically having fallen after made him a promise, after said to him, I will try better, after saying to him, I will no longer perform this particular action, he has full knowledge of all of these issues. He knows my past, he knows my present, and he knows my future. Indeed, if I am to count up my illegitimate deeds, my illicit deeds, they would be bigger than the loftiest mountain within this world. To the extent that really, I would probably forget, I wouldn't be able to enumerate, I wouldn't be able to number how many illegitimate deeds I have done within my life. Moreover, he already is aware of those which are going to come. And despite this, he still has forbearance towards me as an individual. Why would someone who is so grand and superior in authority, someone who is so capable of all, give me this leniency upon myself? Why? And more importantly, when it comes to introspecting within myself, do I have this particular characteristic for me? Am I able to be lenient and forbearant towards another person despite having knowledge of that which they have done? Take a scenario now, in my life, in our lives, when someone has wronged us. Let us say the person has wronged us and for whatever reason, circumstance should play that that person needs to come to me for a favor. Person has wronged me. I have been hurt by it. He should not have done the action. But I am the one in control because that person needs me today. If that person were to come to me having known that he has wronged me, how would that person be feeling when he comes towards me? He would know that I have wronged you. He would know that there is less chance that I am going to give to him because I bear the grudge against him. And superiority complex comes within me where I think I am superior. He has wronged me and now it's my time to shine. Now I am the one who is in control. I can dictate. I am the one who can say no. I am the one who can say yes with pride and with arrogance. The difference is in Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala's innate nature, in his own fundamental characteristics. We praise him because he is the opposite. He has forbearance despite all the knowledge that he has of me as an individual. Thus, when I come to him, he is not the one to refuse me and say, no, I know what you did in the past. I know the offenses you have caused. And indeed, I also know that despite you having promised to no longer do them, you will still go back to doing them in the future. None of this comes to the forefront of the relationship between me and Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. All praise belongs to Allah for he is hilm after ilm. This characteristic has been implemented, has been sought after so much by Ahlul Bayt and has been part and parcel of their manifestation. 
And we need to see this characteristic amongst our family, amongst our friends, and amongst our community. If someone has done wrong to me, I should have the strength, the inner capability to forgive straight away. And not just forgive, forget. It's not just about saying, no problem, I let it, the issue go. But I'm no longer going to bring it up in front of someone else. There's an incident between the Holy Prophet of Islam and a person by the name of Thamama ibn Sanani. Thamama ibn Sanani was one of the senior of the mushrikeen. He was an assassin from amongst the people of the Quraysh within the city of Mecca. When the Holy Prophet of Islam had migrated towards Medina, we know there was this incident where the commander of the faithful slept in the bed of Rasulullah, and people from each of the tribes went to try and kill the Holy Prophet of Islam. However, after the migration, it didn't stop. There were continuously a number of assassination attempts upon the life of the Holy Prophet of Islam. This one individual, Thamama ibn Sanani, was tasked by the Quraysh to go and assassinate the Holy Prophet of Islam. He leaves Mecca, he arrives in Medina. For whatever reason, in his sneaky nature, trying to get position and time and asking people, where does the Prophet live? Where does the Prophet situate himself? Who does he sit with? Where does he eat? In all of this time, Thamama ibn Sanani, when he was speaking and asking these questions, it became noticeable that he was an assassin trying to kill the Holy Prophet of Islam. The companions tied him and bound him inside the mosque of Rasulullah, inside Masjid Nabawi. They bound him and tied him. Rasulullah was called, Ya Rasulullah, there is someone here we have caught, he's an assassin, he's trying to kill you. Rasulullah immediately left and he came towards Masjid Nabawi. How do you think you and I would react if I was told there is someone here who is tied and bound because he is trying to assassinate me? How would I react to this person? Would I slap him? Would I kick him? Would I swear at him? How would I react to him? The Holy Prophet of Islam, as soon as he saw this individual, the first question he came to him, Thamama, have you had any food or have you had any drink? You have been bound and tied. It's difficult for you. You are in a state of fear and anxiety as to what will happen. Have you had any food or have you had any drink? He says, no, I am thirsty. Rasulullah called for a drink and gave it to Thamama. He sat by Thamama now and began to speak to him. Tell me, why are you here? I came here because I was supposed to assassinate you. Okay, we have caught you now. I will give you three options. The first option is that I will release you and you will be allowed to live in Medina under my protection. I will look after you. If you need a place to stay, I will find you a place to stay. If you need some clothes, I will give you clothes. If you need anything, I am the one who is entitled to give this to you. The second option is that you return back towards Mecca under my protection. I will give you the horse. I will give you guards. The fact that you have come to Medina, you are now under my security. In order for you to return back to Mecca, it's an obligation for me to return you back in safety. Third option. I invite you towards Islam. I would like you to say, Ashhadu an la ilaha illallah wa anna Muhammad Rasulullah. Which choice do you have? One of these three options. Which one do you choose? He said, I choose to return back to Makkah under your protection. He left and he went back towards Makkah. Having returned to Makkah, a few days later, the people of Medina found that Thamama had again returned back to Medina. Rasulullah was called, Ya Rasulullah, Thamama has come back, it's only been a few days. Thamama, why have you returned? He said, I wanted to become a Muslim when you invited me with a third option. But had I become a Muslim at that point, the Quraysh would have said that Rasulullah Muhammad would have forced me to become a Muslim. I wanted to leave under the guidance of your akhlaq, the protection of you, your helm and forbearance towards my enmity of you. I could return back safely towards the Quraysh and then I could come on my own ways. 
Therefore, nobody could say to me, I converted to Islam under the, under the force of this. Look at how much forbearance Rasulullah had. As an assassin, an assassin to come and kill him. And yet he could forgive and forget. But not so much that it was actually to the point that his actions caused the conversion of this man towards Islam. A mushrik, an enemy of his, an assassin could turn towards Islam. These are the characteristics of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. He has hilm after ilm. He is the one who is forgiving despite all the power. Afwahu ba'da qudrati. Despite all that we are, he has these particular characteristics. There is a reason why I bring this up now, and then we come to this particular issue of all praise belongs to Allah, He is the creator of everything. Khalikil khalq. He is the creator of everything within creation. These two or three lines of the dua, they are bearing a huge relationship between themselves. There is something very much linked between the concept of Allah's helm after the knowledge of my actions and the fact that He is the creator and sustainer of everything within this universe. What are they? Let us ask ourselves, let us introspect for a few minutes. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is the creator of everything. Sometimes when we sit with our youth, there is a general question that is a burning question. And although it is the youth that generally ask it, it is probably one that is found in the minds and the hearts of everyone within creation. Whether you are Shia or non-Shia, whether you are Muslim or non-Muslim. And indeed, when we pose these questions, everybody in this hall will probably have their own answer and they will have their own understanding as to this particular question. My Lord, indeed you are the creator of everything within creation. But why did you create me? What was the purpose of my creation? I don't understand, my Lord. If you look at the concept, my Lord, you are not in need of me. If I was to worship you all of my life, it doesn't add anything to you. And if I rebel against you, it doesn't take away anything from your grandiosity. If everybody in creation bows to you, it doesn't add. If everybody in creation rejects you, it doesn't take away from who you are. Why did you create me? Moreover, my Lord, you know all that I am and what I'm going to be. You know all of all of creation. You know who is going to heaven and you know who's going to hell. Why, my Lord, if you are the one who is so merciful, why, my Lord, if you are the one who is so kind, will you create an individual that is going to cause havoc within this universe and will end up going into the fiery pitfalls of hell forever, potentially? As in, if you think about it, Iblis is directing me away from you, my Lord. I could know you so well if it wasn't for him. And there are certain people within history, as an example, Mu'awiyah ibn Abi Sufyan. There are certain people that have taken us away from religion and others. Their actions have impacted us. By virtue, Ahl al-Bayt, peace be upon them, were not able to give us everything that they would have wanted to give us so openly with such level of sitting with people. Why did you then create these people who are only going to take us away from you? What was the purpose of all of this creation for you and I? This is a question that is most common. And thus we need several answers at various levels of thinking in order to build upon this and teach our youth, ourselves, but also come to a conclusion that is worthy of the mind that we have in order to build us towards our end goals. What could these be? If you look within a hadith, and within the Holy Qur'an, there are many reasons as to why Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has created us. Let us enumerate four, and then we'll go a little bit deeper into understanding this particular issue. The first one, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala in Hadith Qudsi is narrated to have said, كُنْتُ كَنْزًا فَأَحْبَبْتُ أَنْ أعرف. I, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, was a hidden treasure. I wanted to be known. I want to be known by you. 
in all my glorious nature, I want you to know who I am. I want you to know me through these stars. I want you to know me through my creation within the seas. Once you know me, you will genuinely be able to serve me. Reason one. Reason two, from Quran and Majid, وَمَا خَلَقْتُ الْجِنَّ وَالْإِنسَ إِلَّا لِيَعْبُدُونَ I did not create any of the jinn or any of mankind except that they should worship me. Another translation should be serve me. Because servitude, how do you serve Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala? I can't serve Him. Meaning, the only way I truly serve Allah is to serve each other within creation. That is how I serve Him. I can worship Him, but when I serve Him, I can't serve Him directly. It is by me serving everybody else within creation. Reason number two. Reason number three, we mentioned the other night, the opening verse from Surah Al-Mulk. الَّذِي خَلَكَ الْمَوْتَ وَالْحَيَاةَ لِيَبْلُوكُمْ أَيُّكُمْ أَحْسَنُ عَمَلًا وَهُوَ الْعَزِيزُ الْغَفُورُ The reason why I created is was in order to test you. I wanted to test you in this life. The fourth reason we find within Hadith Al-Kisa. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, I did not create any of this. I didn't create the sun, the moon, the stars, the seas. إِلَّا فِي مُحَبَّتِهَا أُولَاءِ الْخَمْسَةِ الَّذِينَ هُمْ تَحْتَ الْكِسَادِ The reason why I created everything, the purpose of your creation was because of my love of Muhammad and Al Muhammad. صَلَوَاتُ اللَّهُ وَالسَّلَامُ عَلَيْهِ مَجْمَعِينَ Okay, I understand my Lord why you have created me. You have given me these four reasons as to why you have created me. To know you, in order to serve you, in order that you may test me, and in order that I may know Ahlul Bayt out of the virtue of how much you are in love with their creation. These four seek to give us a holistic understanding. However, there are ways to understand this in greater depth. When it comes to understanding these, we are obliged to understand them at a slightly more intellectual level. We want to utilize these four and build upon them as to what they are telling you and I as to the purpose of my creation. Imam says in this dua, all praise belongs to Allah because He is the creator of everything within creation. Why did you create me, my Lord? When I look at my own creation, none of this, and this is key, please, Understand this, especially my younger brothers and sisters. Understand this for yourself. There is nothing which is without coincidence. There is nothing that is just haphazard in the creation system of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Ask yourselves and let me ask myself the following question. Why was I created? I didn't ask to be created. I had no say in the matter whatsoever. Yet you created me. Why was I created in this particular era? Why wasn't I created at the time of Imam Bakr alayhi salam? Why wasn't I created at the time of Alam al-Hilli? Why was I created in this particular era? Why was I born into my particular family? Who is your family? Whatever surname, your maiden surname is, ask it. Why was I born into this particular family? Why wasn't I born into your family? Why weren't you born into my family? Why did Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala allow me to be born in Mombasa, or in Dar, or in Nairobi, or in London, or in Birmingham? What was his reasoning behind this? Was it coincidental? Was it haphazard that he just decided that when sperm met egg, he just told the angels to bring into me the soul. He blew into me the soul. Nine months later, I was born into this particular family. And now I'm just living with these particular tests. Think about yourself as the individual that you are. Why did you grow up in the way that you grew up? Why did you engage in the particular challenges in your life that you have until today? Were these haphazard? I thought that he was the best of planners. I thought that there is nothing outside of his knowledge. 
I thought that there is nothing that tires him. I thought that he is the one who I entrust my entire affair to. If I know this about him, how can I state that all of this is haphazard within creation? Surely, my birth into this particular era, there is a purpose behind it. Surely me as the individual being born into this particular family, there is a purpose behind it. Surely me being born with this particular features, characteristic, my own health, my own wealth, there is a specific purpose behind giving it to me and not giving it to you. Why aren't you me and why am I not you? Introspect for a minute. Ask yourself these questions. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala answers this within Quran. He gives us a verse which is an outstanding verse of philosophy in order to give us an answer as to why I am me and why you are you. Why I have had my experiences in life and why you have your experiences in life. Now just as a side point, we mentioned this yesterday at this youth program. So the youth sitting with us, please forgive me if this aspect is a little laborious or a little repetition. But inshallah we will work through it. There is a line of Qur'an which says, وَلَقَدْ عَلِمْتَ النَّشْأَةَ الْأُولَى فَلَوْلَا تَذَكَّرُونَ Surely, you know the first realm of existence. Will you not then mind? وَلَقَدْ عَلِمْتَ النَّشْأَةَ الْأُولَى فَلَوْلَا تَذَكَّرُونَ You know the first period, realm of existence. Will you not then bring this to mind in regards to your own existence? In regards to the world that you live in today? We are posing this question. My Lord, why did you create me? I didn't ask for creation. You have trialed me, burdened me, physically, emotionally, spiritually, with 70 years of existence. Why did you do this? I created you in the first realm. If you understand correctly your first realm of existence, you will correctly understand the purpose of existence here. What is our first realm of existence? The first realm of existence is actually Alim Adhar. But this verse does not refer to Alim Adhar. This verse specifically refers to the time when you are in the womb of your mother. When you are in the womb of your mother. The reason why we have been created, you will understand it if you truly understand how your growth was within the womb of your mother. What happened in the womb of my mother? What happened in the womb of our mothers? Sperm met egg. When sperm met egg, I was now infused into the womb of my mother and I now begin the process of my existence. I move from stage to stage to stage to stage of my own existence within the womb of my mother. I grow and Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala puts me into the shape with bones. He clothes me with flesh. He makes me into the shape of the human being that I am. He molds me into the features that eventually I will have. And then at the end of the period of eight and a half or nine and nine and a half months or however long it is destined for me to be, my mother gives birth to me into this world. It's a very simplistic way of looking at it. Let us build upon this. If you understand the existence within womb, you will understand existence within this world. The reality of the existence within this world is that I am growing stage by stage by stage. When Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has completed the first part of my existence as a sperm, when I'm ready to burst forth and bring myself to the next stage of existence, He then molds me into the next stage of my existence. When I have completed that stage of existence, He then molds me into the next stage of existence. Why? for the sole purpose of my completion within the womb and readiness to live within the next realm of existence. If I am incomplete, 
If the sperm, if the fetus does not complete its journey within the womb of the mother, it is incapable of truly beholding this particular world. As in, if in the womb of my mother, for example, I am deficient in my growth, I do not have one arm, or I do not have legs, or I do not come out with an ear, or I do not come out with eyes. Because I have not completed the full term, because I have not grown as how I could potentially grow within the womb, the consequence of that will be that I am inhibited in some way, shape or form within this particular existence. Now indeed, that is down to Allah Ta'ala to decide. He decides how I am being molded within the, room, within the womb of my mother. However, the point is that the purpose of the journey of the fetus is ultimately to end up with the completion of its own journey. It will go through stage by stage by stage growth in order to complete its journey within the existence of the womb. It is exactly the same concept within the purpose of this world. I am growing stage by stage. I am being given birth to. And then I grow to being a toddler. Having completed my journey as a toddler, I now move to being a young man, a young boy. Having completed my journey and learning this world as a young boy, I now become adolescent. There is new demand upon my body. There is new demand upon my mind, upon my soul as an adolescent. Then I burst forth and I become a teenager. Having become a teenager, I become a young man. Having completed my journey as a young man, I become a fully grown adult. Eventually, I become an elder man. The purpose of this journey was in order to become a complete human being. Just like I was tasked with being a complete human being in the womb, I am tasked with becoming a complete human being by the time I return back to my Lord. It is the same purpose. وَلَقَدْ نَشْعَةِ الْأُولَى فَلَوْلَى تَذَكَّرُونَ When you understand the stage-by-stage -stage process within the womb, you will understand the same stage-by-stage -stage process within this particular world. Let us elaborate, let us understand this. The universe is unidirectional. What does unidirectional mean? It means it is going in one direction. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says within the Holy Quran, you do not find a change in my sunnah. فَلَن تَجِدَ لِسُنَّةِ اللَّهِ تَبْدِيلًا There's no change in my action. However you see the universe of my growth, however you see my methodology, there's no difference. This entire universe, everything is unidirectional. It is in a constant stage of growth. It is elaborating itself at all times. It is completing one stage of its journey of existence. It is moving to the next stage of the journey of its own existence. Universe itself. It started as this small seed. We started as this small seed. It erupted and it became this entire universe where according to science, there are 850 billion galaxies within this one universe. The commander of the faithful says, O oh, son of Adam, do you consider yourself to be an insignificant mass? If only you knew inside you lives an entire universe. In this universe, there are 850 billion galaxies. Inside us, each of those galaxies and more exist. Heaven is inside me. Hell is inside me. Quran is inside me. The Arsh of Allah is inside me. The entire universe is found within me if only you recognized it. You are growing exactly in the same way. I was a seed. I burst forth. I am supposed to complete my journey within the prescribed time that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has given to me. So universe is unidirectional. There is nothing that does not follow this very same pattern of journey. Religion. We all know the very famous example. Musa alayhi salam comes as a particular prophet. He is clothing Islam in accordance with how the world is capable of holding Islam at that time. 
When Isa alayhi salam comes, he elaborates, he grows the religion a little bit more. When the Holy Prophet of Islam comes, he grows the religion a little bit more. Until when the commander of the faithful is appointed on the day of Ghadir. And now religion has become perfected for you. Everything is unidirectional. It is growing in exactly the same way. The question we pose, the purpose of existence, am I growing in exactly the same way? Am I unidirectional? My body is growing. It's constantly in motion. There's no change. I can't stop this growth. No matter whether I eat or whether I don't eat, when I sleep or I don't sleep, whether I walk or I talk, I am unidirectional. But the purpose of your existence is a spiritual existence. Is my soul growing in accordance with my body? I was like the womb. It went stage by stage by stage. I am now adolescent. I am now teen. I am now adult. I am now elderly. Am I growing in the same way that my body has been growing? Our seventh Imam, Imam Musa al Kadim, salawat Allah wa salamu alayhi, is narrated to have said, He whose two days are the same, he is in a state of loss. And he who goes backwards in his development and growth is cursed by Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. The word in Arabic is la'na. Allah sends la'na upon that person. It doesn't mean la'na curse. It means you are far away from the mercy of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. It means that you are not growing in accordance with how you are supposed to grow. Every day the body continues to grow. Every day our knowledge becomes more and more. I am reading more, I am learning more. But every day the soul is supposed to be growing and growing, elaborating upon itself in order to establish and achieve that ultimate point of completion as to who I am. There is a story. Ayatollah Sayyid Muhammad Rida Shirazi rahmatullahi alayhi, narrates this about his father. His father was a grand marja. It's narrated one day a student had a burning question. You know, we have those questions that we just can't answer in life sometimes. Maybe some of those are, why am I here? What is my purpose? So he goes to his teacher, which is Ayatollah Shirazi. Ayatollah Shirazi had a habit that before he would teach a class, he would open a book, the one that he was teaching, and he would prepare the class before he would teach it. He would review the notes. So you would always find Ayatollah Shirazi sitting in the class, reading and preparing the notes before he would come and give dars. This student who had this burning question can't wait. He bursts into the room of Sayyid Shirazi where he's preparing the class. Sayyidna, I'm really sorry to disturb you. I have a burning question for you. I can't wait. No problem. Tafaddal, if you can't wait, let us speak together. Class is 20 minutes away. Let us sit. What's the question? He says, Sayyidina, if you have one day to live, what would you do with it? Let us introspect for a minute. Why am I here? What is my purpose of existence? We are giving you the answer. It is elaborating yourself. It is growth every single day. <coughs> Sayyidina, if you had one day to live, what would you do with it? I'm going to pose this question to you. If you had one day to live, what would you do with this one day? You see here, most people when they answer it, they will say, I have qada that I have to perform. Or I have to write my will. Or I have to seek forgiveness from brother Muhammad or sister Fatima who I hurt. And they will create a very long list of things that they have always wanted to do. Or all the things that they were supposed to do. And they will answer it with this very long list. Introspect. What would you do if you knew you had one day to live? Ayatollah Shirazi had a normal habit about himself. That when he would answer a question, he would always pause for a minute. He would look down. He would consider the question, think about it, and then he would answer. We're all accountable for the words that come from our tongue. So he would 
wait for a minute and then decide the perfect answer he would want to give. The student says, this is the first time in my life I have not seen Ayatollah Shirazi pause before answering a question, indicating that he had already thought and pondered about this question and already had the answer ready to give to me. Agha, if you have one day to live, what would you do with it? He says, my dear student, if I have one day to live, you would find me doing exactly what you find me doing right now, teaching the students of Muhammad and Ali Muhammad. If you have one day to live, what would you do? The point that Sayyid Shirazi wanted to make is, I don't have those responsibilities that you might have. I don't have to perform my qada. I don't have to write my will. It's already done. I do not need to seek forgiveness from anyone I've hurt. I've already gone and done it. I am ready for death because I am a complete human being. I have grown stage by stage as a human being. I am ready. My Lord, if you're going to take me, take me now. I do not mind. This is how we are supposed to exist. This is the concept of our existence. It is to reach the fore of who I am as a human being. Answer the questions I posed to you at the beginning. Why were you born in the city that you were born? Why did you become born in this particular era? Why were you born into this particular family? Why do you have the weaknesses and the strengths that you have? Why were you given the blessings and the bala that you were given? Every single thing is not coincidental. It is not haphazard. There is a purpose behind every facet of your existence. He is giving you a test because you are weak in that manner. He is giving you a blessing because you are good with those blessings. He is saying, I know your weaknesses. I will try you in your weaknesses so that you may overcome them and become the complete human being that you are supposed to be. I am going to give you wealth because I know you are a generous person. I want you to give your wealth to those people who are in need most. It is all elaboration upon the self. Everything is about testing you as the individual that you are so that you may throw off the shackles that you have as a human being. You may bur burst forth from those weaknesses in order to stand in front of Allah Ta'ala on the day of judgment and say, my Lord, you tested me in this way in this world. Look at the success I have become. Look at Ali ibn Abi Talib as he is struck on the forehead. What is his statement? Fustu wa Rabbil Ka'bah. Indeed, by Allah, by the Lord of the Ka'bah, I have succeeded. In which way did you succeed, Ya Ali? In which way? by virtue of becoming a complete human being. I cannot say I failed. I eventually came to the fore of who I was. And now I can stand before you, my Lord, and say, I completed my journey. The same way you made me complete my journey within the womb, I took care in this world and completed my journey as the individual that I am. That is the reason why we exist. When he says, all praise belongs to Allah because He is the one who has helm after ilm. Why is He so forbearant with me? Because He is a loving master whose hands are picking me up at every time. I saw you fall, but I pick you up so that you can walk. And when I saw you fall again, I pick you up so that I may see you walk with another step. There is a famous line from an athlete that says, when I look at my life, all I see is that I have failed and failed and failed and failed. But it is in my failure that I have succeeded in my life. Because every time I failed, I stood back up again in order to get to the next stage of my own existence. This is why I am here. When you look, this is presented within the Holy Quran. I am supposed to be challenged by my own weaknesses in order to come to the fruition of my own humanity. Take for example, Nabi Allah Musa alayhi salam. Musa alayhi salam as a young babe, burnt his tongue. As such, he was unable to talk properly. When he spoke, he spoke with a slight inhibition. He didn't have the confidence to speak. When he spoke, he spoke with this slight deficiency. 
This was his challenge. When he came to Allah Ta'ala and Allah Subhanahu Wa Ta'ala said, go towards Fir'aun. What did he say in Quran? My Lord, I fear because of the deficiency on my tongue, Fir'aun will reject me. He's being tested to the core of who he is. It's no different to you and I. If you have a weakness, you are being tested in accordance with your own weakness. Why test me with my own weakness, my Lord? Musa alayhi salam was tested. In Quran, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala responds, Musa, inna ma'akum mustami'oon. Go towards him. I am observant. I am listening to your words. I as Allah have confidence that you can overcome this. Do not worry about your own inhibition. Go in front of him. Break forth as the human being that you are. Challenge yourself and grow to the next stage of your existence. It is the same with Nabi Allah Ibrahim. He's being challenged. Slaughter your own son. My Lord, slaughter my own son? Yes, have full confidence in me. Indeed, he went and slaughtered his son. He lifted this and he saw that this was not his son. Break forth at every stage of your existence. This is the purpose of our journey. Challenge yourself tonight. Why am I here? Why was I given this role within my life? Why was I given this existence and not another existence? Why wasn't I born as a companion of Rasulullah? Why wasn't I born in such and such a family? Why wasn't I born in Iran or in Afghanistan? There was a journey that you and I had to take. And there is a goal towards my completion. Who am I? What are my weaknesses? And what are my strengths? If in this month I am unable of overcoming those weaknesses, Ya Allah, in which particular month will I overcome these weaknesses? And my Lord, in this month if I cannot improve upon my strengths, which month will I improve my strengths upon if not in this month? This is the answer as to the purpose of my existence. I am journeying from one stage of my existence until I can stand forth before my Lord. If you look at the life of Sayyidah Zainab, she indeed went through exactly the very same process of growth. There is a narration that comes to us that when she was a child, she has a dream. She sees in this dream that there is this tree and this tree is being blown by this wind. Heavy storms are coming and she is holding on to this tree and she can see that this tree is blowing away and snapping. She wakes up and she begins to weep like a child would do from a scary dream. Oh my dear grandfather, Ya Rasulullah, why have I seen this particular dream? Oh my dear granddaughter, this is representing what will take place on the 10th of Muharram. This tree is our tree. It is being broken by the winds of time. It is being torn to pieces by the enemies of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. She is a young child learning to grow within her own self. And then as she is leaving the city of Medina for the final time, and as she is entering into the plains of Karbala, Oh my dear brother, how much pain do I see coming? Oh my dear brother, please tell us that you will not be leaving. Oh my dear brother, how much I am in need of you in this time. And then on the 10th of Muharram, look at how she is growing at every stage. Look at how she is bursting forth as a human being, as a woman who is a leader of the family. When the children are coming, children are dying, children are being thirsty, children are without food, she is gathering them as the leader of the household of Ahlul Bayt. She is bursting forth, growing at every stage of her own humanity. And then comes when the family are now enchained. And now comes the time when she has to see each of the family members 
and the ones who have been trodden by the horse's hooves, and the ones who have been bludgeoned and stabbed to pieces. The family members are being made on horseback to go between each one of the family members. She sees the body of Hussein, her dear brother. She throws herself off the horse. She puts her hands underneath the broken chest of Hussein and raises the hands towards the heaven. Ilahi, taqabbal minna hadha al-qurban. She is bursting forth through every stage of her existence. And then comes to the pinnacle and the peak and the completion of who Sayyidina Zainab was. She stands in front of Yazid and says, Oh Yazid, do you know who we are? Oh Yazid, the only reason why I speak to you is to scorn you. I am not even in need of speaking to someone as low as you, but I speak to you in order to scorn you. At the end of her sermon, they turn round and they say, we thought it was Ali ibn Abi Talib speaking within this particular speech. <laughs> Please raise your hands and let us join each other in du'a. We pray to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala for the hastening of the reappearance of the awaited Savior. We ask Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala for the opportunity to be alongside Him at all times in our life and in our death. We ask, Ya Allah, there are many people around the world who are in such desperate need, especially in Syria and in Bahrain and in Saudi Arabia, in Afghanistan, in Pakistan, in Yemen, in Egypt and all around the world. We ask you, Ya Allah, give them victory and security, safety. We ask you, Ya Allah, there are many people around the world who are ill, grant them shifa. We ask you, Ya Allah, for the opportunity to perform ziyarat of Ahlul Bayt, peace be upon them all. We ask you, Ya Allah, for our forgiveness, the sins of our parents, the sins of our marhumeen, the sins of all whom we love, all those that love us, all of our leaders and all of our ulama. We ask you, Ya Allah, for the opportunity to die in the love of Muhammad and Ali Muhammad. May I ask you to recite one loud salawat in honor of Sayyidah Zainab. Salawat Allah wa salamu alayha.